The following podcast contains descriptions that may be too intense for younger listeners. Discretion is advised. Good afternoon, passengers. This is your captain speaking. I'd like to welcome everyone aboard this podcast. We are currently cruising at an altitude of 35,000 feet, an airspeed of 450 miles per hour. Weather is clear and sunny with a high of 75 degrees. The cabin crew will be coming around in about 20 minutes to offer you a light snack and beverage. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the rest of the podcast. Hello, everybody, and welcome aboard Pilot Error. I'm Tom Feeney, writer for Wang's Chop Movie Magazine. You may know me from such podcasts as The Deep Dive Podcast, The Deep Dive Microcast, and Mysteries of the Deep. We are not affiliated with Deep Dive Eyebrow Threading or Deep Dive Squid Repellent. This is Pilot Error, where we look at TV shows that never made it past their first episode, usually with good reason. This week's pilot, however, is an exception. It wasn't terrible. It wasn't even just plain bad. It was good enough to eventually be broadcast as part of a different show. Confused? Just wait. In the world of television pilots, there are lots of sitcoms, rom-coms, dramedies, medical shows, legal shows, shows about first responders. You got science fiction, non-fiction, historical fiction. You get the idea. But one genre that seems to get the short end of the bloody stick is horror. Not so much these days, mind you, but there was a time when it was nearly impossible to get a horror-themed TV series off the ground. Why? Well, the answer is pretty straightforward. Uh, back when you needed to fiddle with those funky antennas called rabbit ears to tune in a channel, the whole idea was to create content that appealed to the widest audience possible. Hence the term broadcasting. Both networks and independent stations looked to present programming that would get the most viewers so they could charge advertisers more money for commercial time. What did viewers want to watch? Well, pretty much every genre I listed a minute ago, except horror. Plainly put, no one wanted to scare viewers into changing the channel. In fact, during American television's first three decades of existence, there were fewer than a dozen shows that contained even elements of horror. Oddly enough, television's direct antecedent, radio, didn't suffer the same stigma. There were dozens of radio shows devoted to the macabre, and without the need for sets or makeup, there was no limit to what could be done. Radio was, as acclaimed voice actor Joseph Julian once said, the theater of the mind. There were shows like Bella Lugosi's Mystery House, The Unexpected, The Uninvited, Chamber of Horrors, and perhaps the most famous of all. Inner Sanctum Mysteries. Good evening, friend. This is your host to welcome you through the creaking door into the inner sanctum. Come in. Say, how about joining our Shriek of the Month Club? We're offering free a shroud-bound copy of Die Alone and Like It. It's about an unsuccessful authoress who dies of marital illness. Yes, her husband got sick of her. However, he was thoughtful enough to bury his novelist wife in the basement. And now, at last, she's in the uh, best-seller class. 
<laughs> Loosely based on a series of books by Simon and Schuster, Inner Sanctum broadcast for 11 years and over 500 episodes beginning in 1941. It was an anthology series, as most horror programs were, with different suspense or mystery stories each week. Famous actors of the time like Peter Lorre, Claude Rains, Helen Hayes, and Boris Karloff lent their voices to the show. And lest you think that corporate media synergy is a recent thing, Inner Sanctum was spun off into a series of six films for Universal, all starring the Wolfman himself, horror icon Lon Chaney Jr. And then a decade later came an Inner Sanctum TV show that lasted all of one season in 1954, two years after the radio show went off the air. Now, while Inner Sanctum was one of the earlier entries in television horror, it was by no means the first. Interestingly, the first horror-themed television show was also based on the first horror-themed radio show. Ironized Yeast presents Lights Out, Everybody. It is later than you think. This is Arch Obler bringing you another in our series of stories of the unusual. And once again, we caution you, these Lights Out stories are definitely not for the timid soul. So we tell you calmly and very sincerely, if you frighten easily, turn off your radio now. But if you're fascinated by the mysterious, the fantastic, the unearthly, then anticipate chills in our story of Poltergeist. In 1934, Lights Out premiered on the NBC radio station WENR. It was a very forward-thinking concept, a late-night radio show aimed at an adult audience. Now, that may not seem odd now, but in the 1930s, after 11 p.m., you would have heard something like this on the radio. <laughs> Lights Out was the brainchild of former advertising writer Willis Cooper. He had the idea to create a scary, grisly drama that would air, appropriately enough, at midnight. Cooper's scripts usually involved graphic depictions of death, including characters who were buried alive, burned, dismembered, decapitated, etc. Now, these were all accompanied by what apparently were very gruesome sound effects. I say apparently because only one episode from Cooper's original run on Lights Out has survived. All we have left are the descriptions of how the effects were achieved. Adhesive tape was stuck together and then pulled apart to simulate human skin being torn off. A leg was pulled off of a frozen chicken to mimic the sound of an arm being pulled off. Spare ribs were cracked for the sound of broken bones. So you get the idea. I can't imagine how freaked out early radio audiences must have been by this kind of content. Now I know what you're thinking. There's no way that a radio show from the 1930s could also become a TV show, right? Wrong. Lights Out was brought to television three times. There was a series of live specials in 1946, a regular series that lasted from 1949 to 1952, and a failed pilot TV movie that aired in 1972. Whew. Funny thing is, that's not the pilot we're talking about today. We'll get to that right after this important message. Fruit! Quiet! Fruit! Oh. Fruit! I'm me! Fruit! 
fruit with my fruit-flavored cereal, Fruit Brute, part of your nutritious breakfast. Who are you? But delicious Fruit Brute has fruit-flavored marshmallows for the howling good taste of fruit. Count Chocula's got chocolate marshmallows. Franken Betty's got strawberry-flavored marshmallows. Fruit! <laughs> fruit Brute with a howling good taste of fruit. Nineteen sixty-four was a pretty good year television-wise. New shows premiering that year included classics like Gilligan's Island, Bewitched, Jeopardy, The Man from Uncle, and of course, cartoon legends Yippee, Yappy, and Yahooey. Hmm. Some horror-themed shows premiered that year as well, like The Addams Family and the soon-to-be rebooted by Rob Zombie, The Munsters, for starters. But those were comedies, not straight-up horror. At the time, only The Twilight Zone was the network series that was providing any real scares, and it only did so occasionally. Enter Joseph Stefano. The son of a tailor, Stefano had dreams of becoming an actor. When that didn't pan out, he began writing pop songs. But ultimately, he found his voice as a screenwriter. His third screenplay is one you might have heard of. Psycho. Yes, the Alfred Hitchcock one. In fact, Hitchcock wanted Stefano to write the script for his follow-up to Psycho, The Birds. Stefano had to turn it down. He had already made a commitment to a friend to produce and write for a new TV series. There is nothing wrong with your television set. Do not attempt to adjust the picture. We are controlling transmission. If we wish to make it louder, we will bring up the volume. If we wish to make it softer, we will tune it to a whisper. We will control the horizontal. We will control the vertical. We can roll the image, make it flutter. We can change the focus to a soft blur or sharpen it to crystal clarity. For the next hour, sit quietly and we will control all that you see and hear. We repeat, there is nothing wrong with your television set. You are about to participate in a great adventure. You are about to experience the awe and mystery which reaches from the inner mind to the outer limits. more towards science fiction than horror or fantasy, The Outer Limits was another anthology series meant to compete with The Twilight Zone. Stefano was brought on to write for the show, scripting 12 episodes of its first season. It was during this first season that Stefano wanted to branch out with a show he himself created. And so, in 1964, a pilot was produced for The Unknown. special clammy chill, a deadly gift for inspiring deeper, darker dread. It is the fear of unopened doors, of locked rooms, of bends in lonely roads. It is the fear of the phone call in the dead of the night, of the stranger you recognize, perhaps from a nightmare. It is the fear of the unexpected. The unfamiliar. It is the fear of the unknown. The Unknown was meant to be a companion series to The Outer Limits. It would also be an anthology series, but horror, not fantasy or sci-fi. The pilot episode, written by Stefano, dealt with two women, one played by Psycho's Vera Miles, 
who are being blackmailed into humiliating servitude by a domineering creep. The women agree to poison him to regain their freedom. They manage to do just that while the three are out in the country. They put his body in the trunk of his car and begin driving as a storm approaches. The pair ultimately find themselves at an isolated house and are welcome to stay the night by the owner. He's an enigmatic inventor named Mr. Hobart, portrayed by British actor David McCallum, best known for playing a young spy in The Man From U.N.C.L.E. Mr. Hobart claims to have invented a kind of time machine called a time tilting device, a device that could possibly be used to bring the dead back to life. Maybe even the man our two protagonists just murdered. Now, I'm going to stop here. Not because I don't want to give away any spoilers, and I don't, but because, well, it gets a little complicated from here. After the pilot for The Unknown was made, it was screened for network executives. They passed on making it into a series. Why? Well, we don't really know. The show itself was really good. Very moody and gothic, well-written and acted, and the direction was exceptional. You could say the reasons why it wasn't picked up are... unknown? I'm sorry, I couldn't resist. Anyway, not wanting to waste a great piece of filmed entertainment, the unknown was repurposed. The first season of The Outer Limits was coming to a close, and the whole affair with The Unknown not becoming a series left a sour taste in Joseph Stefano's mouth. He left the show after the first season, but not before retooling The Unknown into the season finale of The Outer Limits' first year. It was retitled, The Forms of Things Unknown. The problem was, The Outer Limits was a science fiction show, not horror. So some changes had to be made. Halfway through the episode, the story diverges from the original pilot and also includes a totally different ending that bent the story more towards sci-fi than horror. That episode was broadcast on May 4th, 1964. In most cases, that would have been the end of it. However, in recent years, the original pilot of The Unknown has come back from the dead. It has resurfaced allowing curious souls the chance to compare the two versions. As for myself, I enjoyed both the broadcast version and the original pilot, but the uncut and untampered with original really stands out as a wonderful slice of claustrophobic tension and suspense. If you are interested In checking them out, The Unknown is available to view in its entirety for free on YouTube as of this recording. The Outer Limits can be seen for free on both the Pluto and Roku streaming platforms. Ladies and gentlemen, this podcast has just been cleared to land. As we start our descent, please make sure your seat backs and tray tables are in their full upright position. Make sure your seat belt is securely fastened and all carry-on luggage is stowed underneath the seat in front of you or in the overhead bins. We hope you had a safe and enjoyable listening experience. If you have any comments, go to the deep dive podcast at gmail.com and drop us a line. Any clips used in the podcast are meant for educational purposes only and not to infringe on any existing copyrights. 
Thanks for flying an Automaton Studios production. Sounds like in a sanctum.